Hi, and introduce them, and then they can introduce themselves. Michaela, do you want to read the, uh, the people who are here? So I don't see everyone just yet, but um, I, since I see Jean first, I'll have Jean start with her introduction. Can you hear us? Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out this mute. Guess who I have? Hi, I'm a student um, in diagnosis right now, actually, with Dr. Foster. Is it Hi, welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jean. I'm the alumni. Um, it's good to see everyone here. Michaela, I miss you. <laughs> Dr. L.A., hi. Do you want to tell us your um, cohort, Jean? Um, why are you helping on the floor? Because I do want to sit on the floor. I'm sorry. There you go. You can uh, see more people that way. Okay, let's see. Cohort 2015 summer, and uh, I'm working at Chris Kyle Patriot Hospital Arctic Recovery Program. I'm a clinical therapist here. Uh, what else do I have to say? <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. <laughs> And we also have Tyler Sanders with us. Tyler, do you want to take a minute to introduce yourself with your cohort? Sure. Um, so Tyler Sanders, everyone. Um, I am part of the originals. Uh, me and Kirby, we were the part of the first graduating class, uh, summer of 2017. Um, so uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I am currently employed uh, in my office, as you'll see, at Coastal Harbor Treatment Center. Uh, we're a residential treatment center, um, very high level of care, very supervised. Um, yeah, that's me. Welcome. Our other original is Kirby Christian. Oh, there you are. Do you want to take a minute to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um. So my name is Kirby Christian. I reside in Massachusetts. Um, I'm currently an outpatient therapist um, on the trauma unit for a community-based program. Um, I also provide in-home therapy services, um, which is a mandate within Massachusetts called CBHI services for children um, with state health insurance. Um, so I operate those two hats. Um, both mental health, both two different um, roles and responsibilities. So, but it's, it's great, um, and I enjoy every aspect. With the outpatient, I work um, with a larger population, um, and, but with the in-home therapy, I work specifically with children and adolescents, 18 under, um, again, with state health insurance. Um, and I, again, am part of the first cohort. And we have Laura Pilcher with us. Yeah, hi, so I'm Laura Pilcher. Um, I graduated in the summer of 2018. Um, I work at Southlight Healthcare in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, we are um, a community-based mental health agency, um, public mental health. Um, we offer a variety of different services, including a methadone clinic, which was originally um, what Southlight started out as. Um, however, I work for outpatient services. I'm a DBT therapist. So alumni in this room, obviously we have current CMHC students. Um, Dr. Rochelle Barnes over there is with her students who are current bachelor's level students. And they just left our panel about, um, you know, what, what grad school is like. And, and one of the questions was actually about employment options. Um, so, so they stuck around and were very gracious. And then I'm sure they will have questions as well about what happens after you get that grad degree. All right, so let's, who wants to ask a question to our panel first? I think a great question is just, 
and just to open it for um, all of our alumni on the panel, what the transition was like for you going from school to the workforce full time. Um, I'll speak. So um, for me, transitioning was fairly easy. Um, and, uh, and hopefully everyone else says that too. But what I found easy about it um, during my internship, I used that opportunity to network. I used the opportunity to um, connect with other professionals um, using, you know, finding a mentor, um, using my supervisor and or other interns just to kind of um, build my own professional network because obviously I knew I'd be working in the state that I'm, um, that I'm living. So um, that's really just all I did to make that transition fairly easy into finding a job. Um, I actually did not start immediately. I gave myself a lot of months off. <laughs> um, we graduated in July. I didn't start working until September. So I, um, I just enjoyed life for, <laughs> for a while. Um, but once I did, I got a job. They were um, very impressed with um, the school and you know how I spoke highly about the school and academics and the support, the internship, um, everything. So the first job I went on an interview for and I really wanted, um, I got. So um, it was really good. And I would echo what Dr. Christian said too. So a big piece of it is also knowing who you are when you're in those different types of spaces. So when you're in a place to start looking for employment after graduation, just being comfortable in your own professional identity and in your own personal identity too, even if it's still developing. No one's saying you have to have it all figured out because that's definitely gonna be a growing process. And as you continue in the field, get comfortable with the idea of what you're interested in currently may change or may develop, or you may find yourself being more drawn to things that you otherwise didn't see yourself wanting to be involved in. But a big piece of what helped um, was also me using my resources. So while I was on my postdoc, I took that as an opportunity to get involved in different types of projects that they were working on that were interesting to me, which then led to my first I don't know if you want to call it like a real job, but my first post training opportunity was the manager of that counseling center, which is something that otherwise probably wouldn't have been something I could access as someone who's only been in the field for maybe 10 minutes. But part of it was developing those relationships, using opportunities to be mentored by the current director, working hand in hand with the campus dean and the college president and not seeing myself as someone who can't do those things. Most people feel like, oh, well, I can't talk to certain people or I can't ask them if I can join them on a project or co-chair or co-host or co-participate. Always ask, the most anyone can tell you is no. So at the end of the day, you have to be willing to put yourself out there, be proactive about things that are interesting to you and get comfortable with the unknowing parts of it so that you leave yourself open to the what if. And another one of our amazing alumni has just joined us, so we will let Michelle introduce herself. We, all you missed was introductions, really. Um, go for it. <laughs> You're muted, Michelle. Uh -huh, there you go. You. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was actually in an interview, so um, that went ran a little long. So um, I'm Michelle. I actually live in Houston. Well, outside of Houston. I graduated last August. That's it. Um, I did not get to take my test until November because of how things fell. Um, and so all of my licensing and everything just happened. So I am going into interview after interview after interview after interview. Um, so far, I've had three job offers, um, so that's fun, and uh, and I am currently in a PhD program. So yeah, because I'm glutton for punishment. <laughs> um, we're definitely going to have you talk more about that PhD program at some point. Um, any other um, responses to Michaela's question? Yeah. Hey, this is Jean. Michelle, I miss you. Seeing you here. Um, 
I miss you, sweetie. (laughs) So what happened with me is I know that I'm going to get into this program. So I planned ahead, actually. I've identified where I want to work at. So I put my foot in the door by applying applying for um, a job in the same facility. So what I did was a different position. And then when I did my practicum and internship, it was easy for me. And now I transition as their, as their clinical therapist. So pretty much my experience is, is just based off on what I have learned as just, you know, a tech all the way to where am I now? So I have like a holistic learning experience for being here and that's how I prepared with my transition. But I'm also working on the outpatient as well with my supervisor. So, you know, um, I have I have been provided both opportunities for residential in treatment facility and outpatient. Okay, we have some questions in the chat box. Um, how was the NCA test? I'm scared. The NCA. You'll uh, be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be scared. Um, yeah, uh, I was about to say. Yeah, it's really honestly, it's really not that bad. Um, so I know, like when when we were going through it, we we I bought the book, uh, bought the Kaplan book, and kind of worked my way through it. Um, I remember I took a practice test to start for the NCE. Um, I live and work in Savannah, Georgia, so you can take either or for the record in my state. So I just took the NCE. So I took a practice test to see where my base knowledge was. And then I went through each area and I divided it up by which areas I struggled in the most, spent more time studying there, took a second and then kind of see where I improved or if I didn't, and then took a third after I studied more. Um, my perspective on it was, it was easier for me. I wasn't working full time, um, when I was going through the program. So it was easier for me to study for the exam. I thought it was easier to take it while I was in school because the information was fresh, um, and everything, and everything was still there instead of having to take it later. Um, and that worked best for me. Um, but it really wasn't that bad. Um, I, my, my helpful hint for that is don't, focus too much on one area because each year they tend to change the tendencies of the test, meaning we had a lot of group therapy questions. Um, and that was the section I least studied. Thank goodness it went okay. But, um, you know, just be careful not to overstudy for one section and have a good base knowledge for every, every uh, section of the test. Yeah, I'll add on to kind of what he just said as far as the, for me, I was, I was like, I was, the two of us were kind of uh, alike in that neither one of us had to work going through the program. So I think we kind of got a little lucky on that. Um, However, because of how my classes fell with my, um, with, uh, with the group therapy and the um, careers, I actually waited because I wanted to make sure that I did have those because everything I had heard from everyone was that there was so much on group or careers. And I was like, I am not about to take this class. I mean, I'm not about to take this test and not have these classes. And so I actually chose to take it after I had finished. Um, for me, some of the other stuff that I was very, very uh, uh, familiar with in school, I had kind of, it had given me enough time to kind of forget a little bit of it. Um, but I studied um like he said, I studied everything. I did focus a lot on career and, um, and groups just because everyone I had talked about had said, folks, make sure you have a lot of that. I'm very glad I did because mine ended up being a lot of um, careers. And then, um, and then I stopped studying. I took it on a Wednesday and I studied like constantly all beforehand, but on Monday I stopped studying completely. Um, and then I went the entire drive. I think I had to drive like 20 minutes because I actually had to go into Houston to take it. And I listened to very relaxing music the whole way. And, um, and I got up, I made sure that I I actually got up um, three or four times during the test and had a bathroom break um, because I couldn't sit there the entire time. Um, 
And so that's what I did. If you end up getting really, really stressed out in the test, because it can be stressful, the way that they word things sometimes will make you probably second guess yourself. Um, just, you know, raise your hand, get up, go to the bathroom, take, you know, even if it's just sitting in the stall, taking some deep breaths or whatever, take that time to do it. It's not timed, you know, just take the time to do it. And, and that way you can calm down a little bit and just try everything you can not to psych yourself up. This school is preparing you. Don't worry. You are more prepared than you think you are. And I think all of us probably have went through the same thing. We all thought that we weren't very prepared and we were all scared. And I think they have a really good rate of us passing. So it's fine. Just breathe. You'll be fine. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, but just thinking about that, I'm like, whereas graduate students on an online program, we're used to taking tests in the comfort of our home, you know, online. And the NCE is going to be stressful because it's not in the comfort of our homes online. Um, so is that a big, you know, adjustment, just being in a testing center facility? Um, how can we prepare for that other than just, you know, just listening to relaxing music, which, which I did for the GRE. I tried at least. But <laughs> um, No go. Go, G. So what? Oh, um, I'm, I'm still talking about the, I, I just want to touch on the NCE. Um, everything that, every material that they give us there, um, it actually really helped. Believe it or not, um, I planned ahead of time, like if I, I, I took mine April, um, January, I already started planning on which block of the NCE I'm going to familiarize myself and all that. And then um, two days before my my exam, I'm still anxious. And it's okay to be anxious. I actually contacted Dr. L.A. I said, like, can you give me a link? Can you give me a study material? And then I locked myself in my room and study everything that she did just so I can see where I'm at. The material that she gave me actually is the closest thing to um, what the NCE and the CPCE would look like. I can't remember what the name of that, but I, I gave everybody a link to it before. And Dr. L.A. put in the chat in the chat that we have a very high pass rate at the Chicago School, higher than the national norm. Uh, my NCE goodie box is that the the link that you were talking about? Okay. All right. Um, and yeah, I give a Dropbox. It's a Dropbox toolbox that I have that I share. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then related to that, Alexa asked, "How different is the CPCE from the NCE?" NCE is easier than CPCE. It is. Dr. L.A. also answered that question in the chat box. Um, she said that the CPCE and the NCE have concurrent validity and are very similar. Both have similar format and content. Ultimately, it's a test. <laughs> I'm looking through the chat box. For, oh, go ahead. I just asked because I just took the uh, CPCE and I'll take the NCE next month. So I just wanted to see if it was like similar, if anybody felt that way. I just want to add something. Everyone should just, all students should just make sure what their state licensure exam actually is. For my state, we do not take the NCE. Um, we take the NMHCE, which um, a lot of our professors will let you know is a little bit harder um, and more intensive in studying. Um, so just 
make sure everyone is not just kind of randomly taking a bunch of tasks to make sure your state will actually um, honor that. I'm looking through the chat for other questions, but anyone can jump in at any any time if you're able to unmute yourself. I know a question that I had actually did come up. Um, if we are able to work and do field work and internship at the same time, um, fortunately for me, I worked with Jean and I did not know until probably like Tuesday <laughs> that um, we actually came through the same program. But um, I'm just trying to see what everyone's experience was. I know Jean said that she did work while she was doing her internship, but is that I guess normal or what would you guys recommend? Um, I wanted to say because I'm in my internship too right now. Um, it, I think it depends on what you have on your plate. Like I have four children. One's autistic, nonverbal. I'm in Alaska where there's not a lot of stuff going on. So it's like if you don't have a lot of things you can do for self-care, if you've got a lot of people who depend on you, you know what I mean, that might make it harder. Um, especially, like, I work in a hospital in Alaska, so I was given four clinics and a roving. Like, I had a, a mandatory shift that I was given because there's other people who have shifts, other counselors in the department. So it wasn't like I would, the place where I was going was really flexible. Once I got my time, that was it. So my life had to go around my internship. Now, other people get internships and they're flexible with their time and everything like that. So it's just going to be a big juggling act. And you're just going to have to see if it works or not. It, you can do it, but it just depends. We're in Alaska too. So oh, that's great. <laughs> um, I can kind of speak on my experience. For me, I there was no way I would have been able to hold down a job. Um, I did kind of like some side weekend, like babysitting, that kind of stuff to supplement income. But I work like my, well, I still work there, but my internship site was like an hour and a half from where I lived. So with the drive time and the time commitment for um, my internship, there would have been no way I could have worked. It's definitely not full time. So I just kind of supplemented my income where I could and took out student loans. But, and I did teaching assistant, like I was a GA, um, but I guess kind of like Alexa kind of said, it's going to be different for everybody. Yeah, maybe if some of our alumni just want to share their experience in balancing that, you know, our personal life and our trying to still work a job and finish up all the rest of our requirements with school. I know for me, that was also a struggle. Um, I also have four children um, and so, and they're younger. Um, my oldest is seven. So at the time during internship, when I started with the Chicago school, my youngest was um, not even six months old. So. Um, I was able to at least stay home for the first um, few, sem few semesters, few years, and it wasn't until um, internship came into play where I had to figure out care for my youngest child. Um, so that was a, a major um, strain for my family, again, because I was, I was able to, fortunate to stay home and study and care for the baby and do all the other household wifely duties. Um, but again, it was still a major struggle for me, but I always stay connected to um, my advisor, my professors, just, you know, try my best to communicate my struggles. I wasn't the best in the beginning in communicating my struggles because I felt, you know, oh, I can, I'm maintaining my house, these kids, this husband, this, you know, this life, I can add school too. So I struggled um, until between Dr. LA and Dr. Soli were like, stop, <laughs> talk to us. We're here to help. We'll do the best we can. Um, and they did. So really had their support in surviving. Um, and I did, I survived a lot. Um, you know, few 
in my cohort, Noma has been into a really bad car accident. Um, I started I started in September. His accident was in January, and he was home medically impaired for about six months, um, where I was in essence failing classes and had to almost well not almost I did I had to fight for school to be reinstated in because my grade slipped for a graduate student. Um, and literally Dr. Soli, Dr. L.A. were right there with me fighting me to be reinstated back in. So, again, when I say reach out to your professors, to your advisor, do it. Um, they don't know your struggle unless you tell them. Um, you can handle it all without the community. That's, that's the Chicago School. That's this program. Um, so I literally survived because my professors believed in, in me and, you know, I was transparent. Um, and again, when I started to do the internship, I had to lean on family a lot. Um, I had cousins and neighbors and church members come and watch my little girl just so I can get in a few hours of internship. Um, but I, I did it every vacation. I was there every holiday. I was there. I took no breaks um, when other interns were taking breaks. I was like, nope, I need to get my hours in. I need to get this stuff together. So um, a lot of sacrifice had to happen. Um, but you, once you, as long as you know the prize, which is graduating and being, you know, um, being in the passion and the purpose of your life, then you then you take the sacrifice and you do it. So um, just lean on your community; they will definitely help you through the journey. Yeah, same. I agree. You really have to um, find your people. And once I found my people, not just faculty and staff, but other students who could commiserate with me about stuff that was going on, and also people who knew nothing about the field of psychology, weren't trying to do a dissertation, weren't trying to find internships, that was helpful because it almost gives you a break from all of that stuff, too. And when thinking about my friend groups, we even had a rule, and most of us were active TCS students at the time or just graduated. It was... Um, this event, we're not talking about school. We're not talking about that place at all. So as much as we did appreciate the foundation and the relationships it provided, because after all, we were in that room together, it still needed to be some balance and boundaries there too. So don't shy away from setting effective boundaries for yourself and for your relationships. Make sure that you honor those relationships, most importantly, the relationship you have with yourself. So making sure that you're taking care of you by doing the things that you enjoy, whether it be alone or with other people. And take inventory of how you respond to certain projects and things that you need to complete when you're thinking about finding balance and space. You know if something's going to take you longer than usual. Um, like Dr. Christian said, make sure you have open lines of communication with your professors, your department chair, your department manager. Make sure you're remaining connected to any person that can best provide you that support, including student support counselors. After all, that's part of what I do now. But be proactive about that type of stuff as well. So, yeah, boundaries, staying connected with your people, being honest with yourself so you can be honest with other people about what you need. And I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that one of the hardest parts for me was being a woman of color and trying to do this whole process, too. You can't um, separate your identity variables and how those show up in the room and how those may impact your help-seeking behaviors and who you reach out to as well. So just be mindful of how you identify and how that may either hinder or help you at least see reaching out as something that's available to you, too. And just yeah, knowing sometimes, I was going to say, just knowing that our plans change sometimes too along the way and not being dead set on something because something always gets thrown in the mix with what we have going on. I went to start my practicum and then found out I was pregnant and had to move everything around so that I could take a maternity leave from my full-time job, get my hours in, physically recover, <laughs> and put all those pieces together but definitely staying connected because without the faculty, I don't think I would have been able to just put all those pieces together. Um, and then on that same note, Jennifer, has, Jennifer Lee has a question in here for our alumni. Did you have difficulties finding an intern, um, a permanent employment, and were you able to work full-time and intern? Oh, that's the one we just answered, right? <laughs> I think. 
Um, if there's a question in here, if a student attends a program in another state and do internships and make connections in that state, how do you recommend students network for job connections after returning to their home state? ACA has a really good um, resource for that. You can actually send out a message there and it goes to all the members and it's a very supportive community. It, you know, you just look, you just type in what it is you're looking for and what support you're looking for. And then um, you get a lot of response and support from that specific community. Um, as far as like finding an internship site, um, I, I didn't, I, I thought it was actually fairly like the process of doing so is fairly easy. Um, if you stay on top of it, the issue you're going to have is if you procrastinate, if you procrastinate and you know, you, you get your top five and narrow it down to your top three, but you're doing it like a week or two before you're supposed to have it. You know, that's something that I saw people run into. Um, but if you if you plan ahead and really do your research and make sure and everyone keeps mentioning this don't limit your options make sure that your top five and top three are as, you know as diverse as possible so you're you're working with as many populations as possible uh, including ages and all demographics um, as for employment um, I was the opposite of Kirby so we graduated at the same time but I wanted to start working right away I was living at home with, with my family um, because I started right out of undergrad. Um, so I wanted to get away as soon as possible and move. Um, so it, it took me, I applied to jobs all over the state of Georgia. Uh, I'm originally from Augusta. So mainly in Atlanta, Savannah, and it took a month and a half. And by that point I'd had four or five interviews, a few in Atlanta, a few in Savannah. Um, so, I mean, you know, it does take some time. Um, it also depends where you're from. Um, you know, if you're in a more heavily populated area in a city, you're gonna have more opportunities. Um, but overall, there, there weren't too many issues. Um, it's actually, you'd be surprised. Being from Georgia, you know, I was thinking how many people know the Chicago school, right? That was something that I actually, at first was like, I was concerned about, but um, I little did I know that, I think it was three out of five, interviews I went into, there was someone that had, you know, an employee from the Chicago school or knew someone from the Chicago school. Um, but my, my advice would be to make sure that you just stay on top of it and get to those things early as possible. Um, because it's very important for you to know where you're going, know who you're going to be working with, meet with who you're going to be working with, your supervisors on that site, um, and feel comfortable. That's the biggest thing. So. There's a lot of questions in the chat that I'm not sure which ones we officially answered or not. Um, let me see. And anyone can jump in at any time too if we we miss something. Um, did we get to Tina's question about paid or stipend internships? I don't think so. So Tina asked, as it relates Both to internships, are there paid or stipend internships? Um, it really depends on what type of internship you're doing. Some people, depending on the type of licensure you're going for or experiences you need, you can create your own internship, and it'll either be salary hourly or it'll be a general stipend. But my program, you have to go through the regular APA internship process, and that's considered salary employment. And it's not that much, but living in Northeast Ohio at the time, it actually made sense, I guess, for the area. But yeah, so it'll be a combination of any of those three, but it'll likely depend on whether or not you created your own internship and what you work out with your training site and those supervisors there. But you would definitely want to check with the licensing board, depending on what type of degree you're seeking, what type of licensure you're seeking, and then what type of work environment you plan to be involved in once you finish with all of those requirements as well. So just be checking in with those folks. 
And at the pre-master's level, I would encourage you to be really careful because we have encountered, fortunately not at the Chicago School, but um, some of the faculty and I at another university where we worked, where there was a pretty popular site that was offering paid internships, and we found out they were billing illegally for the interns' work. And so there was a real significant issue that we had to report to Medicaid about that. So you want to make sure that however they are collecting or paying you, that that's an appropriate and ethical way of doing things and legal. <laughs> so you need to check out everything, read the fine print, don't make assumptions, make sure that you're looking at every option. Um, you know, I know that several students have got, been at their work site and have switched positions and gone and had a position, I think Jean mentioned that, where you know you move into a different position during your field work and then have a different supervisor, and that's certainly a way to do it, and many of our students have done that, but other students have also had to do internships that didn't pay anything besides experience and great supervision, you know, so it's a wide variety of what that might look like, especially at the master's level. Doctoral level, you tend to be more likely to get some compensation, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scrolling through the chat to see what we missed, but feel free anyone to jump in um, with questions you might have. Yeah, a lot, a lot more internship questions. Um, what does a typical day look like and how many hours? What's the average time per week for an intern? I think I know for me that I was on site for 25 hours a week. Um, but I think all of us probably have different experiences at our site because I know that there was a couple of people that were um, worked at in, inpatient. I think a lot of a lot of my cohort worked at inpatient. Um, but I was I kind of got really lucky with my internship site because it was a um, it did everything on a on a sliding scale, and um, with the hours we had, I was able to work with every, like every population that I could imagine. I was able to um, really get um a lot of experience in uh or i guess a little experience in a lot of different things um because i know i was noticing in the in the uh, conversation that people were talking about having you know just doing a couple of hours i was actually seeing clients 24 hours i was there i had clients 23 of them so i that's all i did once i started seeing clients that's all i did um they had to pull my stuff back um, so yeah, it's, I think everybody's site is going to be different and that's something that you're going to want to talk to, um, your supervisor that's on your site about what they're expecting from you because I didn't, I didn't expect to get that many hours on, um, with one-on-one. -on -one. So that was surprising to me. Michelle, I think it might be helpful if you don't mind sharing a little bit about what happens when your site doesn't work out the way you thought it would. Um, actually, I, I was I was very happy though with the outcome. Don't get me wrong. Um, I think it was more so just that I um, the first two weeks I was full. I had only clients, and I and I was you know when you when you go in, you're really excited to get into internship, obviously. Um, but then you get in and you realize that, it, you, yeah, you don't know as much as you thought you did, kind of, um, <laughs> as far as actually doing things. And, um, and so it was more so for me, um, talking to my site supervisor about me feeling like I wasn't doing something right or, um, being concerned about, well, did I do that properly? And, and then having so many at one time, it was, it, it, it was difficult, but, um, just talking to her and, and a lot of times you can get, if you feel uncomfortable, just talk to her, talk to your site supervisor. And then if they can't help you out, then somebody at the school can help you out. I mean, you guys, if you're, if you're in the school, you already know how these, how the instructors here are. Um, just reach out, keep open lines of communication 
with with the professors and they are not going to let you take on more than you can handle. I know, Michelle, you said you are now in a doctoral program. And I think Laura and Jean mentioned a little bit about ongoing education and certifications. Um, so for alumni, my specific question is just about what everybody is planning to do with trainings, certifications, specialization, plans for maybe ongoing education. Um, for me, I try to um, get as much training or certifications as possible. I'm working with addictions and trauma, and then now we are also dealing with different kinds of emotional disorders. So whatever training that I can get, the facility pays for it. So I, I just take all those certifications. When I was doing my practicum and internship, I realized that there's a gap on my education in the university and then specializing on cer certain skills like DBT, you know, ACT and all of that. Having something like that kind of help you um, have a foundational approach that you want to incorporate with your skills that you are learning in the university. So identifying which one that you can relate the most would help you in the long run. So, you know, getting certs now while you are on practicum and internship would really, really help. And also, um, when you're done with everything and looking for a job, having those certifications will also help you be, you know, uh, negotiate your salary, negotiate your position. So getting that as much as you can, if, you're, if you have time to do that, do it now. Yeah, I agree with Jeannie. Um, I also, my employer um, provides um, a yearly annual fee or a slot of money in which you can use really for anything, but specifically I use for training. Um, I know PESI, they offer a number of trainings nationally, um, and I've, um, I've definitely utilized a lot of them. Um, at first, I wasn't sure kind of where I wanted to go, what training, so I just did a lot of things that were more so in my interest of children and adolescents. Um, but as I said, I work on the trauma team um, at my, um, one of my employers. And so um, I've been embarking more so on that. I'm actually, um, I completed a certification to be um, a clinical trauma professional, um, which that has increased my pay <laughs> um, on, you know, on one of my, um, with one of my employers. So that's been, um, really helpful and I'm looking more post licensure on how I could um, expand that in more of a um, private setting. Not really looking into specific private practice. I wanna do, um, I don't know, this is like my, my business plan, so I'm not gonna <laughs> exercise too much of it, but, uh, but it's in the works. But that's, that my idea is to be more of a, um, private professional within, with working with youth um, with some sort of traumatization in the urban setting um, where my current employer is, um, is the larger urban setting outside of Boston, um, where again, a lot of kids, state funded health insurance, low income, um, of other cultural backgrounds, English as a second language, they are just um, trying to navigate these waters and are having trouble, families are having trouble. Um, but they're all going through a lot of street violence, um, in-home violence, stigmatism about mental health. So I really want to help educate these families by utilizing this trauma certification and trauma interest um, to help, just help the whole community. Um, and I'm just right now trying to figure out in what avenues, stay with community-based, stay with private, um, however I can build, <laughs> comes down to. Um, but yeah, like Jeannie, get certifications as long as it's really towards the path that's your true passion and interest. I can kind of speak on this a little too. So um, I just completed um, foundational training um, for DBT. Um, so again, that's going to make me more marketable should I choose to leave my site. Um, in my area, people, our clients actually seek out our services uh, for um, 
clinicians who are trained in DBT therapy. It's very specific behavioral therapy. Um, we work with a very specific population. Um, so it's if I choose to leave my site, it's going to make me pretty marketable. I should have an easier time finding jobs. At the same time, I work in a substance abuse population. So um, me and the other um, provisionally licensed counselors are also looking to be duly licensed as an LCAS, which stands for um, Licensed Clinical Addiction Specialist. And so that also um, in my area will also make me um, more marketable to have both licensed. So as an LPC and as an LCAS. So it'll also help me to ask for more money should I choose to leave after I'm fully licensed for my site. So that's also something to think about if that um, is something in your state, for me it is. So I'm also pursuing dual license, hoping to pursue dual licensure um, here soon. It's more of a issue of money because I have to be supervised for both license and also pay for both licensure. So that's also something to consider. So as we have to pay for our, you know, LPC or whatever it is in your state, you have to pay for your license as a counselor and you have to keep that up to date and get all your like continuing education credits. I also would have to do that for this license. So that's something to consider, but also worth it. So. Um, I would like to address um, the, the chat question about how we are going to juggle work, internship, and also um, family life. It's, it's really hard. It's, it's going to be tough, especially if you also have a job and internship as well. For me, um, what I did was I, I actually told my family, hey, this is what's going to happen. So I'm going to need 100% of your support. And if if you know i am going to be i am going to be missing some of my responsibilities as a mother and then i also told work that hey i'm going to cut down hours because i want to focus on my internship and practicum um it it really helps if um financially you would be able to support yourself but if not you know cuz we're definitely going to be cutting hours that that um, that will support us financially. So that's, that's one stress level that you're going to be facing. So you're going to have to give up one or two. You're going to have to sacrifice one or two. And if, if, if that's something that you have to work around and plan ahead now, do it. Because once it starts the practicum, it's kind of like you hit the ground running you're going to be running around meeting all the standards met especially with the first practicum you're going to do a lot of paperwork a lot of changes and then problems that you don't like your site and everything that's you know you, the, the first few months is really definitely going to be stressful so you might not even have time to even you know cook yourself dinner so think about what you can do as a mother or or just an employee. So just be ready for that and let everybody prepare that those are gonna be the changes. Um, and then the boundaries. Boundaries, you're gonna have to also set those healthy boundaries. Like, look, I'm overwhelmed. Who can I talk to? Have those connections that you have, the, the people that you, um, your classmates, they are so awesome on just like venting all that stress because you are going through the same thing. And then the professors, we are in a very wonderful program to where professors and also your classmates are just so supportive, even just emotional support that you need. They can give you ideas and give you insight on how to navigate through that time management, you know, responsibilities and even self care. So um, make sure you communicate that. That's, that's how I survived this whole internship practicum, being a mother, being, being a, an employee and everything else. We have about nine minutes left. Um, if there's any final questions. Uh, Jennifer, I did see one earlier. Um, I, I, I don't know who sent it in, but someone asked at the end of like them deciding whether to take out an extra loan, like, you know, how finances work after school with student loans. Um, so I'll answer that to the best I can, because it's like, I, I know everything's individualized, but that really is. 
Um, so basically what happens is after, just to give you an idea, um, you'll have X amount of student debt from your loans if you have, uh, no matter how much you have. Um, you can do an income-based uh, repayment plan, which is you know what you hear the minimum payments, so whatever it may be, hundred, two hundred dollars, etc. Um, however, that won't actually pay off the principal amount. Um, you're basically just paying a portion of the payment each month, but basically you're paying in good faith. So your actual debt is increasing still when you're making that minimum payment. Um, so to actually pay it off, you'd have to say if you're paying somewhere between 100 to 200, you'd probably have to be paying somewhere, give or take, between 550 to 750 a month to actually pay off the interest per month and the premium amount. Um, so what I would suggest is that, you know, depending on w your living situation, um, your financial situation as an individual or as a family, um, if you have one is, you know, I, I always say go see an accountant. Um, because that's what the that's what the loan services will tell you as well. Um, so you know that way you can best see it out. Because what will end up happening is depending on your loan service provider and the type of loan, after 20, 25 years of making the minimum payment, you're going to be taxed on whatever that amount has grown to. Um, you know, so say if you have a hundred thousand dollars, by the time you do 20, 25 years of steady minimum payments, you're looking at almost two hundred thousand dollars sometimes in interest. Um, you know, so just, I would honestly invest the money to go see an accountant um, or consultant, tax consultant to see your best options of how you should handle that debt. Um, it may seem like an extra task, but it will come, it will, it will come in handy later on. Also, if you work for government jobs, they also have the 10 year forgiveness plan um, still in effect, I do believe. So, you know, if you do work for a government or civil job, you do have that option as well. Um, like for someone like me who works for profit, uh, in a residential f facility that got mentioned earlier, um, you don't have that option. Um, but you, you can check because there are ways and little, little laws and breakthroughs of how to reduce payments and reduce the amount of debt. So you just need to do a lot of research and take time and effort and put into it. And that way you don't get bogged down, whether it's two years from now or 25 years from now um, with your family financially. Also to jump onto what Tyler just said, I know here in, or I know in Texas, um, if you have worked for a place that accepts, any place that accepts uh, Medicaid um, at, for five years, the state of Texas will pay off $85,000 of your loans. So um, look at your state too, because I know if, if Texas is doing it, I'm sure that there's other states out there doing something similar. Yeah, Georgia has something like that too, I believe. And that's how I, even though we're for profit, I can, the finagling I was saying, but it's it's individualized per state law. So just be very careful. A lot of, I know a lot of Southern states have that tied in to Medicaid or state funded programs. You guys are free to stay in here a couple extra minutes if you want. I don't think there's a, a presentation in this room next. Um, I unfortunately have to run because I'm presenting next. Stay here if you like. I want to, Thank uh, Dr. Barnes and her students for being here. Laura, Kirby, Tyler, Jean, Michelle, uh, Dr. Ellis Nelson, um, and just all of you for being here and asking such great questions. So stick around, um, but thank you from me. Bye everyone. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you, it was so good to see you alumni.